Good evening and welcome to Conservation Conversations presented by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. My name is Kevin Kelly and I'm joined again tonight by our co-host Gabe Jenkins. Gabe, it's good to see you again. How are you? Good, Kevin. Good to see you as well. Um, been a nice day today. We've had a lot of nice uh, few days this couple of weeks. Um, first, let's, I mean, I want to jump right into it. We're talking fishing today. I think you and I both had to have a little jaunt out and try some uh, fishing this morning. What's, uh, tell me what you did. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> so it was a little, uh, you know, a little slow, a little, uh, water's a little chilly. Uh, today was windy, had some uh, rain showers, but I'll tell you what, the last week or so, and I'm sure you would agree, yeah. just the warmer weather, I mean, it just kicks you into the spring fever and uh, just ready to get out fishing. What about you today? Same with well, same with me. You know, we've talked a lot about a different, a lot of wildlife stuff and disease stuff and hunting and fishing and you know, knowing today's topic of fishing and fishing plans is I had to get out. The weather was too great, so I had the big, you know, big fat goose egg got skunked as well. But you know what? It was my second trip out this spring, and it, it felt good to be on the water. Um, you know, the weather didn't hold like I was hoping to, but it was still a beautiful morning. So. Uh, uh, a little bit of humility for both of us, right? Absolutely. And we've got two guests tonight who know a lot about how to catch some fish um, and uh, a lot about the fisheries in Kentucky. Um, so we know that uh, last year we saw a lot of new anglers or anglers who kind of came back to fishing. Um, and so we want to gear tonight to, you know, if you're a new angler and getting ready for, uh, for spring fishing, um, what are some things that you can do to prepare to have success? And uh, our two guests tonight um, have a lot of experience. They've got great tips. Uh, and I'm really excited to, uh, to have them on. So why don't you tell us who they are? So perfect. So uh, for tonight, we have two. Uh, so Lee McClellan, Lee will be joining us. For a lot of the folks who have read the Kentucky Field Magazine or the podcast, they'll recognize the name. Uh, he'll be joining us. Lee is the Kentucky Field Associate Editor, editor and co-host of the Kentucky Field Podcast. And then we will also have David Baker with us, the Assistant Central Fisheries District Biologist. Um, so we got David here waiting on Lee. So David, we'll just kind of go ahead and kick it off. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of who you are, a little bit about your background, some of your passions, if you don't mind. Um, the first reason I ended up in Kentucky Fish and Wildlife is I have a passion for fishing. Fishing is right. my thing. I, ended, I went to school to, to, to get a job with working with wildlife fish, went to Eastern, got lucky, got on with the agency, started off as a, as a, a CEPL. I actually taught conservation programs in our school systems. Uh, I was able to transition from there over to a, a fisheries technician. Again, a lot of experience working for different people as a technician. I've worked on our, our streams, our big rivers. Currently, I'm actually working in the Central Fisheries District. Uh, we cover 23 counties in the northern part of the state. We've got main lakes that we're on is like Taylorsville, Harrington, Giz Creek, and then we got a ton of small lakes that we work on also. Well, uh, I know, for, I know for me personally, I need your advice because I mean, flat out goose egg, and I was on one of your streams today, so we're gonna have to really get into it. I need Lee or David to tell me what to do because it was awful this morning. <laughs> But I will say, and then, and just plus, David, you and I go way back. I mean, heck, we were in college together, so you know, we're oh, yeah. getting a little in the tooth. And uh, but it's good to have you on and 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 hear your experiences and the things that you've been a part of, and really looking forward to picking your brain. Ready and, Lee. And, and so, Lee, uh, go go ahead, Kevin. No, Lee. Uh, so you were my. Uh, <laughs> we were out together today, right? Yeah. <laughs> So the fish gods weren't very kind. <laughs> no, they were not. So um, you're going to be kind of talking to us uh, tonight about um, you know, maintenance of, of rods and reels and, and some tips and, and uh, we'll get an, you know we'll get to know you a little bit better. We'll, you know, ask you to kind of tell us a little bit about your background. But um, really looking forward to it. Lee uh, Lee and I worked together for several years here at the department. Um, and uh, one of the premier smallmouth, stream smallmouth fishermen uh, that I've ever come across and in, in the state. So he, uh, he knows what he's talking about and uh, takes meticulous care of his equipment. I can attest to that. So 
<laughs> but uh, we'll go ahead and get started, Lee. I mean, go ahead and tell us a little bit. Uh, we'll get into our, you know, get into the meat of our program here tonight. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm also an Eastern grad. Looks like we have three here. That's nice. And a hilltopper. Uh, yeah, and a hill, uh, hilltopper. We got three colonels in the hilltop. Yep. So I've been with the agency now 21 years. Uh, it's a miracle. I haven't been fired yet. So, uh, you know, miracles do happen. Um, I'm associate editor of the magazine. Um, also co-host the podcast. I do a lot of public speaking. Um, uh, the the uh, spring fishing frenzy series, uh, Kentucky Field Outdoor Columns. It's been a, it's been a wonderful 21 years. It seems like it's been like five years. It's amazing. Um, I love to stream smallmouth fish. That's my favorite thing. I've been known to drive 12 hours to do it uh, one way. Um, and I love to catch smallmouths in Lake Cumberland, Del Hollow, Laurel. Um, I love to catch trout. I mean, I, I love all fish, but Asian carp. <laughs> so, um, but I, I love to catch stripers too. They're, they're a lot of fun. But my number, my number one passion is waiting and paddling streams for smallmouths. I just, I love it. I, know, I can appreciate your, your wealth of knowledge and the way your passion to share that knowledge and what you've learned and recommendations to all Kentuckians and, and really people all over the country. You know, when you think about Kentucky Field and Magazine, where that goes, it's phenomenal. Um, uh, thank you for all that you do and thank you for the information that you provide. Um, I know I was going to ask you today if you were a guide, but evidently you struggled today just as much as I did. So we know well, that's I, not going to happen. I have donated guided trips and some were great and some not so much. <laughs> <laughs> the, the stream was a little cold and it was kind of high and pushy today. They're just, yeah. it was a little bit lower, a couple of degrees warmer. I think we'd have been okay, but um, you know, and, some days of chicken, some days feathers, you know, it's right. just the nature of fishing, you know. Yeah. You know, I'll so jump, go ahead. I'll jump in real quick that uh, just a reminder, I don't know if we touched on it before, but uh, for those watching tonight, uh, we'll be taking questions at the end. And uh, so go ahead and, and ask your questions in the uh, chat. And we'll try to get to them uh, at the end of our episode tonight. But if you have uh, also, in addition to that, if you just want to put some of your tips for uh, spring fishing success and preparing for the season. We'd love to see them too. So, um, you know, definitely feel free to contribute there, but sorry, I just wanted to throw that out there. I couldn't remember if we hit that or not. I don't think we did. Good point, Kevin. So, you know, for me today was my second adventure out fishing this spring. You know, kind of what we really wanted to do is talk about your preseason preparation. Excited. We've had a little bit of warmth. A few people have gotten out. What are some things that you as anglers, whether you're a novice, a, you know, a skilled uh, angler, all the different things that you prepare? I mean, so a lot of times people don't think about fishing preparation in your gear, but what we really want to do is highlight some things that will help you be more successful, uh, especially on that first trip out. So Lee, we really just kind of want you to walk through some of the things that you do, ready for the season and preparations and uh, kind of go from there if we can, if you don't mind. Well, one of the things that many people don't do is they don't do this enough. They don't re-spool nearly enough. Um, and now fluorocarbon and things have gotten more expensive. I can understand it. One of the ways to save a little money is on your spinning reel or baitcaster, fill up a good chunk of this with, with some cheap monofilament and then learn what's called a uni knot and fill the rest of it with your fluorocarbon. So your $20, 200 yard uh, package of fluorocarbon will get you a lot more than if you filled this whole thing up with that really expensive line. Okay. But um, one of the things that's really easy is Kevin and I've done this before many a times and when, when you have someone helping you, they hold the little Trying to make this pretty. They hold the pencil and you're back here reeling. Make sure it comes off the top of the spool. Not that way. That's bad. This way is good. Why why is it why is it bad? It, it'll reduce your uh, line twist a lot. And I've done them both ways and it comes out crinkly and cruddy, but when it's off the top, it comes out much prettier. Now you're by yourself. 
you can't have anyone help you with the pencil trick. Lay this on the ground like this, attach it to your uh, real spool. But if after a while you reel a few times and it starts doing this and twisting and getting really crinkly, that means you're getting line twist. Flip it over because you want this, the way they wound it on at the factory, you want it to, to mirror the way it's going on to your spinning reel. Baycaster doesn't matter, but in spinning reel it does. So if you've ever re-spooled and then you cast a few times and it comes out bird nest and crunky, it's probably because you didn't you did it by yourself and you didn't flip. So reel it a few times and if it comes out in loose coils, you're good. If it comes out twisting in on itself like that, flip it over. That's that's a really, really easy way to make sure. But this way is best. The old hmm. having someone help you is best. And make sure uh, you, it, it comes off the top now, of the spool, not the bottom. If you have somebody helping you, do you have them hold a little resistance? Do you yes. let it just you freeze? Them, you just don't want to overdo it because it'll cut in on itself. But have them do a little, maybe put there when it's right here, put a finger just to give it a little bit of a break. Hmm. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. But some people want to get it where it's like, ah, ah, ah. Then, then the line will cut in on itself. It won't release freely when you cast it. So, you know, a little resistance, good, too much, bad. Now, and, so, not, and not enough could could affect it as well, right? Not enough resistance. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If it's too loose, then, then you've got bird nest um, big time. Yep. Now, another is, it's going to be hard to see, but you, you want about a nickel laying this way from the end of the spool. You don't want to fill it to where it's all the way flush. Because two casts, you're going to have the biggest bird nest in the history of the world. <laughs> I do it all the time because you want to line on there, you want to cast it far. But if you do that, it'll just start going crazy. And then you'll end up losing a bunch of line because you've screwed it up. It's better to underspool it a little bit than to overspool it. So remember, make it about, always go basically a nickel laying flat that far from the top. Now, I'm going to adjust my camera a little bit. Here's an easy way to do like a little, a little quick and easy five minute loo job on a spinning reel. This is a reel that I've had experience with doing this because it's one I've waited in the ocean or the Gulf with and dumped it a few times and, and washed it and all and got back and it was acting really cruddy and like, it, it, it. so I I got tired of tearing it apart. So take off. This is your little, uh, Right there, that's the little nut. Sometimes there's a screw right there. There's a screw, remove that screw. Usually, a lot of them anymore, there's not. And what you do is you reel backwards. Voila. And then inside, I wish the light was a little better. See that hole? There's a ball bearing assembly right there. You take a little oil. Drop it down in there, and that'll lube that bearing assembly that may have gotten crud in it. It may have gotten all the oil washed out. And let that sink in. Sometimes you can get lucky and do the other side as well, and you can get another bearing. But usually, you don't get that lucky. So, Lee, you, you were dumping some oil in there. Is that? You know, this is good. This is real oil. Real oil, okay. Don't use 3-in-1. Don't use WD-40. Don't use that. Get good premium real oil. Um, some of them anymore have a, uh, they're molecularly uh, bonded. They will, they will bond to the metals. They're, they're kind of expensive, but they're well worth. And then to put that back together, just take your, uh, hold your uh, rotor right here. Crank it. Tighten it. Then you're back in business. And then, Right here, this is your roller bearing. That's what puts the line on the uh, spool. These can get crud in them, they can get sand, they can get dirt. Put a few drops of lube right here, with this good oil, and that'll, that'll keep that happy. And then take your bill or bail and right there. And then where they meet, put a little oil right there. And I always try to go work it back. A lot of times that'll get tight, just a little bit of oil and that bad boy will loosen right up. So 
and I always put a little bit right here where the handle meets the rest of the handle shaft. So, now, Lee, Lee, do you wipe off any excess or you just let it yes. soak in? Yes, especially off the body, but I like yeah. to let it soak in a little bit and then I'll wipe some off. Yeah. Uh, so do you, Lee, do you recommend like in a bake or a, uh, not a bake, but as a spinning reel like that, do you recommend you take the line off? Would it hurt the line if it got a no, little bit of oil on it? won't hurt the line, no. Um, one okay. of the things I, I do a lot of, too, is I use a lot of the, not a ton, but the reel conditioner, like there's a lot of, or the line and reel conditioners work a lot to, to help. That's oil, too. So um, it, it'll really help with um, with twisty, crinkly line. It'll soften it up and make it better. But the oil won't hurt. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I have a question. So <clears throat> if you do a lot of stream fishing, you, you're bound to get, you know, sand or just debris, you know, in places that you, you know, on the reel that you wouldn't expect. One of the places that I find it is beneath the spool. Yes. And do you, is that part of your, your process? Oh yeah. I always take the spool off. This one's got a lot of grease on it because it's an ocean reel. Yeah. But yeah, you, this is your drag up here. A lot of people don't realize that this little knob there is your drag. And then you take your drag off, you pull the spool off. And I've got grease on here right now because this one came that way. But you, you can add a little bit of oil here to your spool shaft like that. And then a little bit on that gear and then a little down here. And that'll help a little bit too. And sometimes for good measure, this one has grease in it because it came from the factory. So I don't do it that way. I'll put a little oil right here on the drag. I don't know if it helps or not, but I do it. <laughs> and that. Actually, inside that little hole there is where your drag is. I hope you don't realize that. That's that's when you crank it down. It cranks down on that, and that's what puts pressure against the uh, shaft to make it either go let out a lot of line or let out or any. So you just crank it back down, and you're good to go. Make sure you seat it, too. Sometimes they won't seat with it, and you can't get it to start. But now, this is not a complete one. This is just if you're out stream fishing, you dunk it. You're in a farm pond in a float tube, you dunk it, you drop it, you dunk it, and it starts acting cruddy. For a complete deal, this is your side plate. You'll need to remove that, pull it off, clean it. A lot of people use alcohol and a cotton swab. There's some commercial real cleaners on the market. And anywhere where you see a gear, you apply grease. Anywhere you see a bearing, you apply oil. But you'll need to do that about once a year. Pull the, pull the whole thing off, clean it, but for a quickie job, this works. I've had this reel hardly turning, did that, and I was fishing 20 minutes late. So nice. This one's starting to get some miles on. So you're carrying that oil with you in your in your tackle box then, correct? Well, not all the time, but when you get home. But if I know I'm going to be in a high area like that, especially in the ocean I do, if I'm going on a long trip, on a float trip, um, I'll bring some, I'll, I'll keep some oil in there just in case that happens. But this mainly is, you get home, it's a little cruddy, and you want to fix it up pretty before you go next time. Okay. Now, Mr. Baycaster, there's a quick and easy way to lube it. First, most of them have a little, this is going to be hard to see, but most of them see that little do flippy there, they have a little button. You push that, then that usually comes off to the side. Then you pull off your side plate. That's usually the one that has your magnetic do flip on, your magnetic braking system. So right here, that's your spool. You pull your spool out, look at that. And what you wanna do is wipe off the crud off of this, right there, get rid of that. This one has a bearing assembly. So what we wanna do is have it not roll off the table. <laughs> <laughs> that helps put a little bit of oil right there where, where you pulled that from where you pulled the spool shaft from then apply just a little bit of lube here to the spool shaft and since there's a bearing assembly apply a little bit right there some people use grease on this I prefer oil grease often captures crud so then you put it back in put a little oil right here And then they seat, takes them a while. It helps if you put it the right way. That, that usually. 
We'll go with one today. <laughs> sometimes these can be a little bit of a bear to get seated. Sometimes they're easy. See, it's almost seated. Then you slide it up. Done. And this, I've had these go. You're like, God, oh, it's not going very well. And just do that, and it's amazing the difference it makes. Also, it's going to be really hard to see in the light. Right here, where your line thingy is, where your line uh, level wind is, there is a gear up underneath here. And it's a worm gear. And it often gets crud and stuff in it. And I've had a reel one time that I was like, well, I'm going to have to sell this one. I, I can't get it to do anything. And I've tore it apart and all. And I just put some oil right there. I could not believe the difference it made. And that's a little worm gear in there. And just put a little oil on that. This one, I haven't cleaned this one in a long time. And it's dramatically better. Now, again, is that a substitute for tearing it apart? No. But this will get you through a few times a year. And then when it's boring in the winter, you can pull them apart, uh, grease your, all your gears and everything. Never throw your reel box away. Because that has your schematic in it. And your schematic is the diagram of all the parts and how they fit together. That thing is a godsend. So don't say, oh, I don't need that real box anymore. Don't, and I keep mine in the box so I know which schematic goes with which reel. So I keep all my old uh, reel boxes. I have quite a collection. But that way, if I need to do some repair, some lubrication, I've got all the stuff I need. So, now, is that exhaustive? No. But that'll get, that's a good little quick way to lube up a spinning reel and lube up a bait caster. I can't believe the difference in this. Yeah, I, I had a spinning reel, so I, I took one of my boys out uh, over the weekend, and this old spinning reel I had, it, it kept catching. I was like, I know I've got, you know, there's some sort of, you know, obstruction or debris in there, and sure enough, I took it out, you know, did what you did what you said you described here, you know, cleaned it and put a little oil in it, and it's perfect. You yeah. know, it it makes a big difference so. yeah you just get a little little bit of sand a little bit of crud in there yeah and if, at the wrong at the wrong place it can make a big difference so i wanted oh, before we move off topic i wanted to go back to the um the line pulling question so okay. one thing i had for you lee is how often should i change my line you know if i've got just monofilament i'm a not you know average fisherman go out a couple dozen times a year you recommend a year, every year change it? What's well, you know, me, um, if you're doing a lot of fishing where you're going to be banging on rocks, I've been known to re-spool like every third trip. Now that's okay. me. <laughs> but really, I would never go more than one year without putting new line on. Uh, now, with the advent of fluorocarbon and braided lines, it's kind of the old rules don't apply as much as they used to because – I mean, it's prohibited. I mean, good fluoro, 200, 250 yards is going to cost you about 18 to 25 bucks. That's expensive. So, again, do the backing deal I was telling you about. But even fluoro, I I'd usually would go at least twice a year for me. Now, if you don't, I fish a lot more probably than the average person, but uh, at least once a year. Okay. But if it starts getting crinkly and all, that's the only contact you have with the fish. So, why skimp? You know, right. nothing. What I'd rather have a fish jump and spit it than to break me off. That is just my pet peeve because usually I, I, I was too lazy to retie or I've waited too long between re -spoolings. But if gotcha. you have mono, if you're going to use mainly mono, I, I'd go three times a year because you know you can get spools like this, you know, three thousand yards on them for under ten bucks. So, you know, but what? But when you're talking about fluoro, it's a different animal. But again, if you use that backing trick, it'll really save you some money. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. So, Lee, you, you know, in addition, so we've talked about line. Uh, we've talked about real maintenance. You have in the past built your own rod. So let's yeah, talk I've about. Got a few. I'm going to build a good fly rod next. And I want to build a really good bait cast. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It can be frustrating and tedious, but it's a lot of fun. But one of the things you also need to do, and I bought, I've got a little fly rod here, so um, not the perfect. See these little, this is the, the stripper guide, but that looks just like a spinning guide right there. Clean that with a, you know, a non-abrasive cleaner. I mean, I've used Windex, I've used the, uh, 409, I've used any of that stuff. And just get rid of the crud off there. But another thing you can do once a year, 
is take a cotton swab and go along the inside of this. Almost all of these are a hardened uh, ceramic material, okay? And they can crack, especially if you fish in cold weather. So if you run that swab in there and it catches on anything, uh-oh, you've got a cracked guy. And that'll you'll want to inspect that. Sometimes you can get away with it, but if you have a cracked guide, it's going to get worse. It's going to catch your line and you're going to break off. So crack guide, that's that's repair time. So sure. the way to check to see if they're okay is take a cotton swab, run it on the inside. If it catches and the swab pulls away, you know you have a crack. So if you've got a cracked guide, at that point you need to replace the whole guide. Is there anything you can do to kind of well, it's really hard to take the little insert out and stick it back in. You, you'll just have to have uh, have the guide repaired. I, I do my own now. Uh, if you break one, right. I'll fix it for you. I fixed Jeff Miles' a couple of his rods for, <laughs> but uh, or just just um, inquire at a tackle shop. If you know anybody does any rod repair? I need to have this guide replaced. And you know it won't be that much compared, especially if it's a good rod. You know, it won't be that much. I mean, most of your guides that go on, even your high end. I mean, those alkanites. You know, like your average, say seventy-five dollar rod, that guy costs about a dollar fifty. So gotcha. it's it's not it's not that much. Could so be the difference between that, uh, could be the difference between a, a trophy fish and not, and and, you know. and breaking off. Yeah. yeah, you know they've gotten better, but they, that can still happen, especially if you kayak fish a lot, you bang your rods a lot, or if you're you're always getting them in and out of your rod storage and you bang them, they can chip and crack pretty easy. So that's a good way to check and see if you have. I had a bad guy on a, I broke off a little crappie. I was like, what? That big chunk missing out of one of a crappie rod I had. And I had to you know, put a new guy in. So just that's something you check in the wintertime once a year. Just if you use like different types of line, mono versus fluoro, will the fluoro potentially wear those guides, especially out towards the, the tip, or is that they usually are pretty? Well, fluoro and, and, and mono you're good with. Braid may, some of the older guides, but. Uh, Braid may wear on them if it's getting pulled. You're fighting a huge fish and it's pulling all in one place. But really, not anymore, but that won't happen. The older yeah. ones that were softer, like I grew up in the 70s, braid we might eat them alive. But now, you'll be okay. Okay, cool. Well, it's never a big fish problem for me, so I don't have to <laughs> more the like the, you know, the tree trout or the rock fish that I've got <laughs> snack on. <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> we're closing in your car door yeah i think oh done, yeah yeah done that or oh, I've, yeah. oh I've, i was going to new river on a big trip with my buddy he won he's in a fishing club and he won a free trip to new river got a trip and we came this was at the time when 64 still had a few toll boots he accidentally hit all windows down and our rod tips flew out the back window he rolled him up, snap, snap, snap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I had a rod. It was my favorite rod, hand built. I've been dreaming about catching a big small mouth for me. I brought my hand built rod. I lost <laughs> not that much of it. And I had to borrow the guy's rod. <laughs> However, it was a G Lumis bronze back, and I now own one. So the exact nice. same rod because I loved it. So bittersweet. But uh, that, that didn't turn out so well. <laughs> All right, so, you know, wrapping up, we've covered rods, we've covered reels. Any other things that you think of, kind of go checklist, hook, you know, things like that? I know one thing we've all, we've missed it, that's very important before we go fishing we need every year. So uh, talked about some of those things else that you think about. Well, buy your license, of course. Um, right, here we go. And one thing that I always do in the winter is organize your stuff. Pull out everything. Because if you've been fishing, you'll stick this one in that box and that one in this box. And then, oh, man, where's my uh, bag of uh, so-and-sos? Um, oh, that's right there in that other bag. Just go through your stuff and, and get organized. Uh, it makes a big difference. And kind of organize it by species. So you can grab two boxes. You don't have to buy, grab your tackle box that's 25 pounds or 30 pounds heavy. Just grab a few boxes and psh, off you go. Um, but the main thing is go through your stuff and pull it out and, uh, and don't expose any of your line when you're storing it in your spare room with it. Don't expose it to any uh, sunlight. UV light's right. terrible on fishing line, especially monofilament. You don't want that. So, but, but I, every winter when it's boring during Christmas break, I pull everything out, go through everything. Any rusty crap and all that, I throw it away. 
and uh, any old hooks that aren't worth a poot. And check your lures, your favorite lures. See if the hook's been bent. See if you need to replace a hook. And sharpen them as well. I always try to go back and sharpen, especially my crankbaits. They've gotten a little dinged up. I like to sharpen those hooks again. Or replace them. Gotcha. Um, I know I can I can appreciate the the shortage in, in supplies. I did the same thing a couple months ago. You know, last year with COVID, it was kind of hard to get stuff in the summer, just a, a decline in, in fishing stuff. And I broke out my tackle box and started thinking about spring fishing. And look, man, I was short on a lot of stuff. So mm-hmm. off to the sporting goods store, I went stocking up. I'm ready now. Yeah. Uh, my wife about had a fit when she saw all the stuff that I was buying. But that's <laughs> I was like, listen, we're getting prepared. This is very important. <laughs> So, yeah, I know. I, I've heard it too. I've heard yeah, that too. Yeah. You don't need another <laughs> reel, but but I really do. <laughs> Even though I have 40, I need 41. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Lee, you've offered some great tips uh, tonight, and um, hopefully, uh, hopefully our viewers tonight, um, you know, see the value in, in just – uh, some of this preseason maintenance that you can do and uh, you know, but it does pay off, um, mm-hmm. you know, later in the, as you get later in the season, the tip about just organizing your baits by species. I mean, that is, I mean, great. I mean, it just, it's very helpful. I used to carry a duffel bag and I'd have striper stuff when I'm smallmouth fishing and I'd have largemouth stuff when I'm, you know, and now I just, I grab three boxes and I'm out the door yeah. and uh, it's just a lot better. And going through your stuff, too, you can avoid what happened to you, Gabe, is you're out there, it's like, oh, I have one of this worm left. Why didn't I go yeah. buy more? And you catch yeah. a fish on it, and it breaks off, then you don't have anything. Yeah. So going through your stuff will keep you from, from that from happening to you at the beginning of the year. Good deal. Well, Lee, we're going we're gonna, to uh, have you back on a little bit later um, to, as we talk more about spring fishing. But if, uh, if it, David's still there, um, you know, uh, we'll start, um, you know, talking about uh, boat maintenance and, um, you know, things you can do. And, and um, Lee, really appreciate it again. No problem. Uh, so, David, welcome back. Um, why don't you tell us, you told us a little bit about yourself, but, you know, you spend almost like every day on a boat. So you've probably seen uh, it all and, and know what to look for. Um, but you're going to be talking a little bit about that and, and, you know, what sort of things that, that can be done now, uh, you know, if you're getting ready for spring fishing, but maybe kind of talk about just, you know, what you do on a daily basis, um, now for as in the central uh, district. The best part about my job is I do get to spend a lot of time on the water in a boat, talking to anglers, learning from other anglers so I can get better, better fishing. And the other thing is, is outside of the work boats, I've got a boat of my own. I do a ton of fishing myself. Last weekend, me and my son were out the driveway going through our boat, making everything's ready to go because the 60 degree weather, we're ready to get out. <laughs> so I said, we got to get it ready because, hey, we all, we've all been cooped up all winter. We've been sitting here itching to go, but we really haven't paid no attention to our boat. It's not, it may not be ready. A few things just to make life easier when you get out. So this is some of the stuff we do with our work boats. This is things I do on my personal boat. Again, we're a little rusty. We haven't launched our boats in a while. We haven't loaded our boats. Let's put, let's put the ball in our, in our, in our court and uh, see if we can make it easy on ourselves. So here's where I start off. I start off with the trailer. So the trailer is what gets us to and from the lake safely. So I start with the trailer. And, w- and what I do is I'll get me a can of lubricant, uh, like a WD-40 type product. And what I do is I start at the coupler. Again, that locking mechanism, it, get, it gets a lot of weather on it. It does get a little corroded. It can get frustrating to get it to lock onto your ball and hitch properly. So the moving components of that, I will spray that to, to get it moving uh, back and forth properly. I'll also hit winch stand again you're using that to crank your boat up you don't want to be fighting the locking mechanism you don't want to be fighting it trying to get it to turn you so hit all the moving parts of it with your with your lubricant also inspect your strap they get old they dry rot they, they can get frayed Every, we get them they'll get off center a little bit and they'll get in the gears and you'll kind of up 
And next thing you know, you're trying to crank it up and you pop it and you're trying to repair it at the ramp. So just inspect it for frays and, and, and make sure it's in good shape. The, the next thing I do is I keep working down the trailer and I get back to my axle, my tires, my wheels. Hopefully this, as we got done with the fall fishing going into winter, everybody took the time to inspect their hubs, pack their bearings, replace seals. You want to look to make sure you don't have fish in line wrapped around your axles that will cut into your grease seals, cause them to leak, lets water get in there and causes pr premature wearing on your bearing. So you'll check that. I, I did mine this fall. Everything looked good, put it all back together. But you know, as it sits there, you get air pockets and stuff in there. Check your buddy bearings. Make sure those springs and plungers are pushed out. That way you still keep a little bit of pressure that keeps that water forced out. So just make sure your bearing buddies are still ready to go. Again, keeps the water out, keeps your hopes nice and cool. You don't have axle issues running down the road. The other thing I check is your air pressure in your tire. Like my garage is not heated. It, not, temperatures went up and down and all over the place since I used it last. So I can guarantee you my, my tires are gonna be a little low. It's just how it works. So then check your air pressure in, in your tires. The one you need to make sure you don't forget about is your spare tire. Because yeah. if you do have a problem, you wanna make sure you can switch it out and get back on the road and not have to call for help. So don't forget about your spare, make sure it's still in good shape. The other thing, after you kind of get done looking at your wheels, your bearings, and inspecting that, your grease and air pressure, I move on back to the trailer. And I want at this point, I want to hook my trailer to my truck because I want to check my lights. I want to check my running lights, my my brake lights, my turn signals. Again, a lot of us we go early in the morning. It's dark. We want people to be able to see us. We really want us to see our boat and not run it over because we want to go play for the day. So make sure all that's working properly. Again, we want you to be safe getting there and getting home. That's just as important as being safe on the water though. So you got your lights working, you know, um, the last thing that I would probably do in a general sense and keep in mind, everybody's equipment slightly different. So you might have to tailor it just a little bit different based on your equipment. But the last thing I like to do look under your trailer and make sure you don't have any wires hanging down out of your trailer frame. Again, as you're going down the road, road debris can get up and rip those wires out. As you launch your boat at the ramps, right now we just had flooding. There's tons of debris sitting around our ramps. As you put in and take out, you don't want to hang stuff up and potentially pull your wiring out and you have to rewire your trailer, hook your, hook your tail lights and things like that back up. So you kind of will use those few steps you should be pretty good. You should be good to hit the road. So I got, I got one. Traders yet? Yeah, I got one question for you. I know David is. So with your bearings, are you going to use just yeah. your regular old grease that you're going to put in the tractor or lawnmower, or do you want a more marine grease? I know that thing's going in the water um, for your new 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 boat owner. What's the what's the best kind of grease you should look for? You, you can just use general ax, axle grease. Uh, probably your better option is they do make a lot of marine greases now that, that are de designed for your hubs and stuff for getting into the water. And that way, if you do get some in there, it doesn't, it doesn't break down quite as fast. Uh, but in a general sense, there's a lot of good marine products out there. Uh, I would, I would, encourage people to, to to use those products okay um, on their on their hubs um, again it also works good that same grease in your grease can works good for your grease points on your outboard motors as well I think that's all that I could think of that I wanted to ask you covered it pretty thoroughly yeah. okay again we, we, we do a lot of travel up and down the interstates and there are our hop We lost him. Uh, it's a big deal to us because of the amount of miles and wear and tear. And being broke down the side road is awful. And, you know, make sure you, make sure you have a low wrench so you can change your tires. Make sure you have your, your jack in that typically comes in your vehicle anyway. 
just just verify you have those few maintenance items you need to to take care of basic uh, issues in case you do have an issue on the road. I know I'll, I'll have to tell on myself. You talked about the uh, spare tire that got me. I was a victim of that. I had a nice blowout on my tire. Went to go get the spare tire, jacked it up. It was flat. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And one of the one same thing, lack of preparation. I was not prepared and, and paid for it, unfortunately, in that case. Hey, anybody that's pulled a trailer's done that. Yep, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, it happens. Again, you know, you don't think about your spare tire, do you need your spare tire, right? Yep, yep. All right, so let's let's get off the trailer now. Let's think about the boat. So run me through all the things you can right. you do the, the to kind of prep yourself. All right, so so here, here's the here's the bit here's the big things I want to point out. Is the first thing that I want to do is I just want to make sure I have all my required my state required equipment. So what that includes, uh, first and foremost, and, my, and to me is you need to make sure that you have a life jacket. So so the thing that you need to remember with the life jacket is is that there has to be one for every person that's in the boat, and it has to fit them. So that it can't, you can't have a child in the boat with an adult life jacket, it doesn't count. So you, you need a life jacket that fits every occupant in your boat. The other thing is, is you've got to make sure that it's not torn and the zippers and buckles are working properly. Okay. So that's, that's step one that we take care of. Uh, and, so, and readily accessible. Yeah, and one thing I do want to point out that we, we get some questions about when we're out uh, working is, if you have the inflatable life vest that auto deflate or you blow into the straw type white jackets, those have to be on your body at all times or they do not count as a PFD in the boat. So it is a little different where if you have your life jacket like this in the boat, it counts, but if it's inflatable, it has to be on you to count. The other thing that you, you need to have is a throwable uh, dev device. I, I use this as a seat cushion because it's just really good padding while you're fishing and it's comfortable, but it also is required uh, that way in case you need to assist somebody or, or an occupant in your boat, you can toss it out to them and give them another option for flotation. A couple of the other things that you're required to have, if you have any type of flammable uh, liquids in your boat, being that uh, your, your gas, kerosene, propane grills, uh, you're required to have a, a fire extinguisher what you want to do is just make sure that it's charged and it's, it's good and operational. Again, a lot of us, these sit in the bottom of our boats for a long time. They get, they can get wet, they can get corroded. They have to be replaced periodically. So again, you need a fire extinguisher, again, readily available. The other thing is, is you're required to have a signaling device. That could be an air horn. Uh, I keep it pretty simple. What I carry is, I just carry a gym whistle. Again, if you need help, you just have to have a way to get somebody's attention. So pretty simple, but, you, but you're required to have it. The other thing is, is your navigation lights. So you're required to have, if you're out at, uh, at night, uh, before sunrise, after, after sunset, you have navigation lights. You, you're required to have one in the back that's white and one in the front that's green and red. What I encourage people to do, do is plug them up, turn the switch, and make sure they come on. I actually tested mine this weekend, and it did not come on. So mine was pretty simple. I took the cap off, the light bulb. Again, it gets moisture in it. The contacts were a little corroded. Wiggled the light bulb back and forth a few times, cleaned it off, and we're good to go again. So... So those are the, those are the few state the, the state required by law that you have to have as far as your safety gear. Depending on what type of boat you have, there's a couple of other things. Um, that's the general stuff for most people. Here's the other things I recommend: a paddle. We've all been out there and the boat won't crank. Yep. It's a sick feeling. Yeah. And <laughs> you're floating down the lake and you're going, "Hey, I just would love just to get to the shore at this point." So. Yeah. A paddle of some sort. The other thing is, is have some type of rope in your boat in case somebody needs a tow, you need a tow, you need to tie off to a dock while you're loading. 
And I'll tell you a story. I just saw week. The guy had an old rope in his boat. He backed down the ramp, shoved his boat off. The boat hits the end of the rope, and the rope snaps in half, and his boat goes down the lake. He's like, man, I wish I'd, I would have checked that before I pushed that off. <laughs> so, you know, they sit at the bottom of your boat. They get wet. They get they get, they rot. They get mildew. Um, you know, check them. You know, it's got to be a sick feeling to watch your boat float away. Yep. Yeah. Um, so definitely have some way to, to, to as a tow rope, tie off rope. Um, that's that's important. And let's. Um, I know. So I know the. I know the one thing that I am absolutely paranoid of when I get to a boat ramp or before I leave the house. It's that little drain plug, um, <laughs> and making sure I do one. It's still there, or I haven't forgotten it, and I have a backup because. You want to talk about a sickening feeling if you forget and if you forget that drain plug, it's it's a bad day. <laughs> it's gonna be a bad day. I'll tell you what, we work we work on a boat about every single day of the year. And I still forget the drain plug about once a year. It, <laughs> it just happens. But yeah, I actually keep I actually keep two in my personal boat just so I have a backup. Um, because you just never know. Um I will tell you from personal experience. It takes a long time to sink a boat for through a one inch hole. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It'll panic you really bad, but you um another trick is is if if you if you do forget you launch, they pull the trailer out and you're like, oh no, this isn't good. You can put your boat on plane and it will drain the water out of your boat. Uh once it drains it out, you can stop and put your plug back in. Uh the the other thing that I recommend for people with their boats is go through and just your bilge pump. Hit the switch, make sure it hums, you know, just go through everything that you use on a regular basis because all it takes is a, a little bit of debris or a little piece of fishing line to wrap up on your impeller of your bilge pump and it won't work. So go through, hit all your buttons, hit all your switches and just verify there's no issues because when you get out there, all you want to do is play. You don't want to go out there and be bent over in the back of your boat with a screwdriver and, a, and a, a wrench trying to figure out how to make something work. You know, you're out there to play, so do it at home and then you just got to play. So one thing that came to my mind, especially when you think about the first time out, the first few times out, boat registration. You know, especially something, you know, those boat, those, what, they, wait, when do they expire? I believe in the end of the month, isn't it? April. I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember for sure, but okay. I can tell you this. I just got mine from the county clerk that says, come spend some money with us. Right. Well, that's <laughs> the biggest thing is check those those uh, numbers on the side of your boat. Make sure those are all displayed in there. And then your license is current. Those, those licenses are only good for a year. So I've been guilty of it. Head out to go out on the water. Registration has expired. So if you have a boat that requires registration, make sure that you look at that and uh, get that updated before you hit the water um, that this spring. So, you know, for your, for our folks who have boats, boats that do need those registrations or anything that's got a motor, that would also include a trolling motor. So, you know, inboard, outboard, any type of motorized uh, way to push the boat, you're going to need to make sure you get that registered. Yep. Those registrations expire uh, April 30th. April 30th. Yep. yep. April 30th. Yeah, I know we mentioned right, it again. I know. Do what? Go ahead. I know we mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I do want to just kind of remind everybody again, like myself, is that, you know, with the degree weather, we've been out doing a lot of habitat work. We've been seeing a lot of boats moving up and down the road and on the lakes already. Uh, again, we get excited. It slips our mind. Make sure we get on there and get our fishing license just to keep ourselves out of trouble in case we get checked. It's real easy, log onto our website and uh, you can do it all like from the house, print it out and you're good to go. It's pretty pretty quick and easy. You got got the fishing license that, you know, you covered this at the very beginning, but the life jackets, life jackets, life jackets. It is so important that you wear that life jacket. You've got that life jacket accessible. You never know how fast you can be thrown from a boat or you know, a wave. It's just the best rule of thumb to wear that thing at all times spend the money, you know, if, if you don't like the heat and you're in the summer, spend the money on one of the smaller inflatables. It's your life you're talking about. So make sure that you do that. Make sure you inspect those. It's extremely important. 
couple of things that I, you just jogged my memory on is uh, on, as far as life jacket goes, I know we've seen a lot of issues this past year. We've had a lot more people on the water than normal, a lot of first time people on the water. Um, and there's some confusion of, the, of our paddlers not thinking that they're required to have these life jackets with them. So just, it doesn't matter what type of boat you're in or how it's powered, if you're on the water, you're required to have a life jacket. Yep. Um, the, other, the other thing is that's really important, especially for, for boats with outboard or inboard motors, is to, to wear the kill switch. Kind of like you said, Gabe, anything can happen. Right now, we've got a lot of debris on our lakes. You don't necessarily see it. You run down the lake, you hit it. If you get ejected from the boat, the last thing you want is your, your boat to run you over. Yep. Clip it to your life jacket. It's just, it's just a good practice to get in. Well, I think that covers us, David. Thank you uh, for all no the information and kind of giving us your expertise. It's a very thorough walkthrough from the trailer to the boat. Um, let's bring Lee back on with us tonight. Let's just talk about spring fishing and some of the opportunities and things that are, that's kind of upcoming if we, if we don't mind. And again, if anybody who's watching has a question, go ahead and uh, uh, enter it in that uh, chat function over there on the uh, right side of the uh, right side of the screen. And, you know, we'll be happy to answer it. So I guess really, I mean, David, we'll talk to you, Kevin and, and Lee, we all got skunked today. So, have you been out yet? Talk to talk to me about what you're planning to do. You know, when you get out and get a chance to go fishing, he's gonna come back. <laughs> He'll come back. Oh man, I just slayed him the other day. Yeah, well, I'm sure. <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? So I actually <laughs> went fishing today and <laughs> did really well. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, um, so so I'm excited. I'm actually done this from my boat. This is the most time I've spent in my boat this year. So I'm excited from that standpoint. Um, probably will be out this weekend. So uh, I, I have had one trip with the kids this year. Uh, we hit the Scott County Fins Lakes with the trout stocking. Yep. And so me and my kids, moved, we decided we we're going to make a bet. Whoever catches the first fish gets to make the other two kiss it. Trout <laughs> tastes bad when you kiss them on the lips. <laughs> beat us bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. so lee and lee and david what are what are some opportunities that, that uh, you're looking forward to the spring like what lakes you know what species uh those types of things well um the white bass and saw guy run will be happening sometime soon i intend to be hitting that uh with vehemence that'll be fun um, and I always go down in March, hopefully toward the end of the month, I'll be on Lake Cumberland with my old buddy Joe and catching some striped bass. Um, we've done really well in March. Um, and I want to get my kayak out on some of the smaller lakes and catch some large mouse here in April. Um, uh, and of course I'm going to be paddling streams whenever I get a chance. So, and I want to hit the tail water more this year. I haven't had a good trip down there in two years. So I'd love to get on Cumberland Tailwater and catch some some nice trout. I'm dying to do that. I hear the uh, the cicada hatch later on this year is going to be yes. uh, phenomenal with the uh, uh, Cumberland Tailwater. So looking forward oh, to that. And, and that, there's an annual cicada that happened. I went out with a, a good friend of mine, and he's like he put a cicada, and then we did a dropper off of it with a uh, feed it pheasant nymph off of it, destroyed. It. Toward the end of the day, these monsters were just completely oblivious to the boat, would come up and just roll on that cicada. I mean, nice. I caught three over 20 inches that day on that cicada bank. Huh. Oh, they were, it was exciting. You could see them coming. It's like, do they not see me? They're going to spook away. And they, oh, they just roll. On. So that's going to be exciting. You no, know, one thing we, you know, we're talking about spring fishing, but, you know, a week ago we had epic flooding all over the state. A week, week and a half ago. So if you're thinking about going fishing, trying to hit a stream or some of our big lakes, any recommendations on how to check water or the water levels? How do you know that it's safe to get out? Uh, you know, you don't want to load up everything and drive 30 minutes or an hour to the lake. And uh, I can't even get the boat in because of the high water. Any, what, what can you tell us about that? Well, Dave and I both were talking about this the other day. Before I do any stream trip, 
the first place I look is the USGS stream flow gauge for Kentucky. And uh, right there. And, you know, some people have had a little difficulty in um, explaining this. Uh, when I've, I've had some tourism people call me and say, I, I can't understand this. So maybe go down to under Kentucky River, Gabe, if you don't mind. About three quarters of the way down, you'll see Elkhorn's just down, this, down the road here. If you keep scrolling just a little bit. There's a Elkhorn Creek near Frankfurt. If you keep right down at the very bottom. Click on that, right where you, just where you're hovering. Click on that number to the left. There you go. Yeah, right there. Now, scroll down. This is a very important page. This is right there. That gauge is showing you the cubic feet per second, which is a gauge that shows you how much water is going by that gauge per second. And it's a little above 400, it's about, it was 485 when Kevin, when Kevin and I waited this morning. As you can see, it's been on a downward trend. And these little triangles you see are, are the median point. And that's based on 81 years. So the median point for that day. And so if, if you're planning a trip and you see this line here way above the median point, you know that you're gonna be looking at high and muddy water. But if, if, if you look and it's well, well, well below the median point, then you know you're probably looking at low and clear water. And usually, especially in the warmer months, when it's near the median point, you have pretty much optimal conditions. So if it's way above that, you can kind of, for fishing anyway, and for safety reasons, if it's well above the median point, you know you've probably got not very good water. If you scroll down a little bit more, there's, there's the gauge height, which is relative. You know, now it's dropped from nearly six feet to just under three and a half since the fourth. So she's been on a downward, downward uh, fall. And, and some websites and stuff have a recommended gauge. David did an excellent job helping create the canoeing and kayaking page. We'll talk about more of that in a minute. But he has recommended gauge, height, gauge heights and recommended CFS levels for streams that, that they've profiled. They've profiled quite a few, and that really helps. But uh, one of the things that happened last year is several people, families went and bought kayaks. It's COVID, they're bored. They went and bought the, the $150 kayak at the department store, and then th the creek was flooded. They were like, oh, I guess that's the way it's supposed to be. I remember one family had to get rescued out of Taylorsville, Tailwater, uh, they were in trees. They got blown in the trees, they grabbed a hold of them, and their boat went gone. So a lot of people don't know what's low, what's medium, and what's high. So if you don't know, go to that website, look at that gauge. Then, then you'll save yourself a two-hour drive if it's too high. David, so you, anything add to that? You and I have talked about this quite a few times before. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think you, you said you were going to pull up those stream websites just to kind of show people what they were. Uh, the websites we're referring to have quick links. Uh, in, embedded in that, so you can get to those those tables that Lee was talking about. The Army Corps of Engineers uh, put out daily reports, also to let you know what lake levels are. It also talks about what they're discharging uh, currently and what they're planning for the next morning. Again, just so you can plan your trip and be safe. The last thing you want to do is get out there in high water, have the water rise rapidly while you're out there. So, but yeah. The USGS is, is an awesome, awesome resource, typically for strength, smaller stream fishing. Typically, I tell people, regardless of where you're at, good rule of thumb. If it gets much over a flow of about 250, you really don't need to be out there. If you're a, not, if you're a beginner paddler, about 200 is about all you want to do because if it gets more than that, your opportunities to react and compensate uh, to a hazard just dramatically. You mentioned the, so, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, their daily lake report. So yep. the, the Louisville District Daily Lake Report, this is if I'm, I fish at Cave Run. Um, and so you know, Cave Run is at 747. It was, it was 20 feet above Summer Pool just recently because of all the high water. 
So when it's 20 feet above summer pool, it's in the trees, boat ramps, you know, can't be accessed, dock, you know, courtesy docks, you can't get to them. So this is a very helpful page too, if you're a lake, lake angler. Um, and David, thank you for, for bringing that up, but I just wanted to pull out there. So you can just search, you know, you know, Louisville District Daily Lake Report and it should pop up. So just wanted to know that. So, David, I was going to... You could click on that canoeing and kayaking page on our website and show David was very instrumental in getting this thing up and running and it's a tremendous resource. Yeah, so David that's wants on our website. That has all the things we've been talking about contained in one place. So if you scroll down, you'll see all the options that you that you have on there. Yeah, so so when we put this page together, we were trying to make it a one-stop shop for being able to figure out where to go, what the conditions were, and what your expectations for that trip should be. The, pro the problem was is that you had to go to four or five places to get all that information, and then you had to compile it yourself. Um, so hopefully th this is a, a very useful tool for people um, to get out there, to have a good time, to plan a safe trip, be able to figure out the distances between takeouts so you can plan accordingly for that. And then also we want to make sure we got some tips uh, that we stole from Lee on how to catch some of the species in these streams. <laughs> so if they don't work, it's Lee's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like so, like click on the stream fisheries yeah. uh, if you don't okay. care. So yeah, if you scroll if you scroll down a little bit, it'll give you a. Link. Uh, of the streams that we have some of this uh, extra information on. Yeah. So you, you can click on, on the stream that you're interested in finding a, a float trip or a way trip on. So if you want to, just go ahead and click one, any of those. That'll corner be good. Everybody, a lot of people are familiar with that one. And, oh, okay. if, it, and if it works, we'll... <laughs> well trust us it's very good you know <laughs> yeah I, I will point out as you, whoop, as there you go. go to this page the, the gentleman that's that's over the project now he's still as they go out and they get more information that they're adding more streams uh every year so you know check back with it on this page uh periodically as new things will be added uh, and give you a different, some different options for trials from different places in the state. There. There we go. Perfect. There. So yeah, so, so each page, we, we, we kind of, we kind of uh, filled them up with some really good pictures of fish that, that were sampled from these places. Um, again, you can find the rip, the stream le levels. When you, when you go to there, it'll take you down to those links we talked about with USGS and the Army Corps. Uh, there's maps that show you if you put in this access, you can take out the following one, and this is how many river miles. Uh, sometimes anglers run into issues because their GPS tells them by the way the crow flies. And then these are some of the recommended uh, levels that, uh, that, that we would recommend. Again, the recommendations, they're, they're based on your skill and proficiency with, with being in the moving so this is just a good good place to get started. And then then, then some more eye candy, you know, rock bass and smallmouth. So what we tried to do is because a lot of access sites uh, are not always labeled real well. There's not a lot of good signs. We took pictures because you want to make sure. You want to make sure that you're in the right spot. It's a safe, it's a good safe place to park your vehicle. You have permission to access the, the creek or stream at that location. So you can you can click the link that says additional information and directions. It'll pu pull it up in Google Maps and give you directions right to it. We've got pictures that way when you pull up, you're like, I'm definitely in the right spot. And there's just a short description that goes with it also. Ton of useful information here, guys. I mean for for somebody who's not aware of this and you like to spend time on the water, this is this is great. You know, this resource, you know, 
combined with Lee's Blue Water Trails. I mean, it is uh, fantastic information to have at your fingertips uh, before you even pull out of the driveway. And uh, it gives you, it help, helps give you the confidence that one, you know where you're going. And two, you know, you have a reasonable expectation that, you know, if I follow, you know, if I follow what, what these folks have told me, I have a good shot of catching fish. And uh, it's, you know, it's just another, you know, another tool in your toolbox uh, when you get out there and fish. So David and Lee, thank you so much for uh, all, the, all the effort that you've, you know, gone to and put in to you know, make that information available. It's, uh, it's an incredible resource, as I said. So um, I have a feeling that we could talk, we're right about an hour. We could probably talk to these two, Gabe, for another two hours. And uh, absolutely we could go all night. <laughs> you guys. Are... <laughs> Do that, brother. Do that. <laughs> so we'll have to, we'll have to have you on again uh, for yep. sure, because there's, there's so much more ground to cover and just talking about, and you two are so knowledgeable uh, about uh, the fisheries in the state and how to catch fish. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate, uh, appreciate you joining us. So, um, Gabe, what else, uh, what else do we want to cover here? Yeah, I think we've got it. I mean, we really wanted to really stress the, the importance of the maintenance of your rods and reels, boats and stuff to kind of get everybody ready and thinking. I know for us, this warm weather's here. We're going to be talking a lot about fishing over the next couple episodes. So what we really wanted to do was prep our, prep our listeners, think about your maintenance, think about the things that you need to do to make your next trip successful. So David Lee, thank you. Thank you for all the work that you've done uh, with the department and all the things. And we appreciate your expertise and sharing that with us tonight. You're welcome. We're awful lucky to get to do what we do, you know. Yep. So. And we'll look forward to reading your articles and seeing your pictures uh, in, in the future. And uh, with that, we'll leave you guys. And thank you very much. I right, thank you all for having us. Yep. So, um, for, uh, for those who, who were watching tonight, we, uh, we hope you enjoyed this as much as we did um, hearing from, uh, from Lee and David. And uh, um, you, one, don't forget your fishing license right. um, if you're gonna go out but, uh, anytime soon. You know, the license, new license year just started. Um, and if um, you, know, you have a, a other questions, uh, feel free to give us uh, the, the department a call. Uh, the information center can be reached at 1-800-858-1549. Um, and Gabe, you want to wrap us up tonight? Absolutely. So thank you for the folks who are watching tonight. Uh, we have, a, like as I already said before, we have a lot of fun stuff coming. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about fishing over the next couple of weeks. Now that we're getting thinking April, May, also turkeys. So a lot of fun's coming up. Um, so also for our folks, if you've not already do, done so, we want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So if you uh, want to do that, if you look over our YouTube channel, you'll see a bell that hit, has, says subscribe, click that, and then hit all to receive all the notifications to be alerted about all the fantastic resources that we put on our YouTube channel, both for this series and all the other information that comes out of the department. And then you can see that and be in the know with everybody else. We'll be back on March 25th with lots more discussion about spring fishing and the fishing forecast for this coming year. We hope you enjoyed it tonight. Thank you, and we'll see you in two weeks.